Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. I'm going to give you a trigger warning on this one, guys. Um, this one's hard to watch because I love evangelism. I love apologetics. As many of you know, that's been a part of my life. And when I see it being done badly, it really hurts my heart and it hurts everything within me. I mean, it, it's like I, I want to scream at the at the at the the channel and say don't listen to what he's saying he's not telling you the whole truth he's not doing a good job here um and the guy's name is joe and let me let me say some nice things about joe first he handles himself very well um in in the conversation he doesn't get heated he's very kind um he 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 does answer some of the questions okay from an apologist standpoint uh some things like for example she brings up uh, original uh, manuscripts, and everyone knows we don't have the original manuscripts, but he seems to think we do have the original manuscripts. And and so that made him look really bad, and so that was just a lack of education. He also didn't know about some of the, the things with regard to Noah's flood and some textual criticism issues. Um, and, and what I would say to someone who hasn't, um, and I, I do this for myself, I, I, Joe, I'll put myself in, the, in, this, in this category. If you're not trained on some of the basic questions and dealing with atheists, like some of the textual criticism issues, the flood questions, the age of the earth questions, those kinds of things that always come up, um, either, either make sure you learn a lot of those things before you get into a conversation with an atheist who like this godless granny that you're about to hear. It's a, it's a, a grandmother, an older lady who was a Christian for a long time and has left, left the Christian faith and is now an atheist and apparently wants to start a YouTube channel to, to bring her critique and her journey, uh, becoming an atheist. And so they're having this discussion. And if you're going to go on a channel, a, you know, a channel like that, that's somewhat popular. I, Braxton Hunter, Dr. Hunter sent this to me and I appreciate him sending it to me because it really does illustrate why Calvinism, if it's false, uh, and notice I say that if it's false, because if Calvinism is true, this doesn't make a hill of a beans difference. I mean, the elect are going to get saved and the non-elect are going to be damned. And, and so, it, it really doesn't matter how good or bad this guy does or how good his answers are. Um, it doesn't matter if he thinks their original manuscripts are, are we have them and we really don't. And he gets proven wrong on the screen. It doesn't matter if um, uh, he doesn't have answers with regard to uh, the you know, universal flood versus a localized flood and those kinds of questions that are brought up. Uh, the, the textual criticism question. It doesn't matter. If, if she's elected and the audience is elect, they're going to get saved regardless of how good he does in preparation for his apologetic and evangelism efforts. It, it has, it, it has no bearing on it. Um, but if he's wrong and we do have legitimate free will, then what he's doing is damage to the kingdom. He's doing damage to our apologetic and evangelistic efforts. And so I, that's why I that's why I'm so passionate. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about this Calvinist is what if you're wrong? Have you considered the fact that maybe the first 400 years of the Christian Church didn't get it wrong? Maybe the majority of apologists and um, Christian philosophers and theologians throughout the generations haven't all got it wrong. Maybe you're in the minority because you have misinterpreted certain passages like Ephesians one and Romans nine and John six to favor your position. And, and maybe you're wrong. And if you are, can you, can you at least step into our world well enough to go, what if I'm wrong? How could I possibly be damaging the Christian effort to evangelize and to make good sound apologetic arguments? Could you at least consider that? And then, and then tread lightly when you have these kinds of discussions with people, that's, that's the most I could ask. Before we dive into this, again, trigger warning, it's going to be hard for you, especially if you're not a Calvinist. Even Calvinist, you're going to get triggered by some of this because some of the way in which he answers, you're probably not going to necessarily like or you're going to wish he'd done a little differently. You're going to hear some ball gate stuff come up, bail gate, whatever you call it, ball gate. That's coming back into the mix because she asked questions about uh, his own children. So that's trigger warning. So there's going to be some difficult conversation there. But before we jump into that and watch this video together, uh, I will be watching some of the ch side chat. Uh, I will get to the super chats by the end. And if you have questions and those kinds of things, so feel free to, to submit those. I appreciate the, the the donations and I appreciate those who give. As is scrolling on the bottom of the screen, if you haven't downloaded the app so that you can get more information from us at Sociology 101, please do that. 
and support us if you can through a one-time donation or become one of our monthly patrons. Our monthly patrons get a free download or the tiptoeing through Tulip material, and we always appreciate those who give to help make this uh, uh, this listener-supported ministry a reality, and we do appreciate that. Also, if you're looking for a higher theological education, please consider trinitysim.edu. You can find more information there at Soteriology 101. If you uh, click on that class link at the top of the page, you can learn more about Trinity and how you can be a part of uh, Trinity Seminary and get a higher theological education. Okay, with that said, I am going to play this video. And again, brace yourselves. This is hard, hard to listen to. And uh, we will comment as we go along here. Here we go. 1984, uh, my husband and I lost our first baby. I'm sorry. And when that happened, I re-examined my faith and I clung to my faith. I stayed with my faith for one reason and one reason alone. And that was, I said, the Bible is the bedrock of my faith. If the Bible is true, then Christianity is true. And come what may, I stay with God. Okay. But once it was proven to me that the Bible wasn't true, the foundation of my faith has now shattered and it all collapsed like a house of cards. Okay, so before we move on here, um, I want to I want to recommend to you some good apologists who could answer many of the questions that she brought up. Um, I put a link in the show notes that you could go watch the entire video and her uh, criticisms of why she has come to believe that the Bible is not true. Um, and there are a lot of different arguments that the flood argument, there's a, the age of the earth arguments, all those kinds of things. And, and I want to point you to, instead of me just criticizing the Calvinistic apologist and just not offering anything better, I want to offer you some better apologetic arguments than what you're going to hear from the Calvinist apologist. And, and not all Calvinists are the same. Again, I've said this a thousand times, but there are some Calvinists who I know and have respect for who would have handled themselves better in some of the arguments that were being made than, than this particular Calvinist did. And so I'm not trying to lump all Calvinists in with this guy and saying, because he's the Calvinist and therefore all Calvinists are really bad at doing apologetics. Uh, that's just not, that's not true. There's some Calvinistic leaning apologists that are decent at, at handling these kinds of questions and, and that don't even use necessarily their Calvinism uh, within their apologetic methodology. Uh, they make even more of a, a you know, a classical approach or a evidentialist approach to apologetics, and they actually do a better job in my estimation. Um, but nevertheless, I want you to know about some resources that are available. I mentioned Braxton Hunter a little bit earlier. He is the president of Trinity Seminary where I work. Um, and this is where I, I one, of, one of the books I cut my teeth on in learning apologetics um, with core facts with Dr. Braxton Hunter. Um, I put a link in the show notes so that you can get this. It's well worth your read. Uh, you can get it on Kindle for uh, three bucks or something. I mean, it's really, really affordable. Um, and and a lot of what Trinity has to offer, they have apologetics courses. Uh, Braxton and Jonathan Pritchett do a great job teaching on apologetics. And so I really highly recommend Trinity Seminary if you want to get a higher education in doing apologetics. But if you want to start with just reading a book to get you uh, better equipped to talking to atheists or unbelievers, uh, I, I recommend going to Core Facts. Also, I, I, I have to mention my friend, Eric Hernandez, uh, who I used to work with, um, has a, a book called The Lazy Approach to Evangelism. He does a really good job taking the, the focus back to the main thing. Um, it, it, can a person go to heaven and still believe that the earth is old or still believe in uh, a localized flood? or still believe in something different than you believe in with regard to the historicity of uh, Job, or of course, th those are those are non-essential things. And so the whole lazy approach to evangelism from Eric Hernandez, what he's doing here is he's helping people to say, don't, don't get distracted by all the little um, things that sometimes Calvin, uh, not Calvinists, um, unbelievers want to bring you down a particular path to get you off topic. And, and he's really good. And that's why it's called the lazy approach. In other words, here, here's an easy path for you to take to get them back on the right track with regard to the gospel. Get them back to Jesus. Get them back to the resurrection. Uh, get them back to the main thing because that, that's where the focus needs to be. 
And so if you're looking for a, a really good book on how to do um, kind of those conversations uh, for, for the layman, to have a conversation with an unbeliever, an atheist, this is another really good book for, for you to pick up. Lazy Approach to Evangelism by Eric Hernandez. Again, the link is in the show notes. Grab it. Um, also, just some other ministries that you should be aware of, apologetic ministries that I recommend. Of course, my friend um, there at uh, freethinkingministries.com, Tim Stratton, also a part of Trinity Seminary. Uh, he, he teaches courses there. He's got some great books and some great arguments. Um, he's recently wrote a, a paper um, called The Deity of Deception with J.P. Moreland that really, really, I, I have really appreciated him doing that and, and from a scholarly perspective, taking on the concept and idea of, of uh, really what free will is all about and the, the necessity um, of not just the doctrine of free will, but the understanding of how free will is the better explanation as to why people have false beliefs. So why do Christians disagree with each other? Well, either God ordains Christians to misinterpret his Bible or we, liber we have libertarianly free will as Christians. And so he, he really takes on that challenge and does a really good job of that if you're looking for that kind of uh, material. Also, Frank Turek, uh, been on his program. He's been on mine, uh, does a great job and has all kinds of resources. One of the best presenters um, that does an awesome job if you have him come to your church or to your event. Um, he, all, he always does a great job every time we've ever had him at one of our unapologetic conferences back in the day. Uh, Dr. Frank Turk, I highly recommend. And of course, William Lane Craig is... Uh, he's on a whole nother level of <laughs> of intellect, and a lot of people who have uh, done apologetics have learned from William Lane Craig, and he has a lot of really great arguments and really great resources there at reasonablefaith.org, and so I highly recommend him as well. And so notice I'm not just critiquing the way a Calvinist does this. I'm saying here is some alternative resources for a woman like this to recognize that if you, you've come to believe that the Bible is not trustworthy, please look at the best of the best scholars, look at some of the, re, these resources that I've just presented, um, because I think there's a lot stronger arguments to present. Um, and again, I'm not faulting Joe necessarily, the Calvinist in this particular video. Uh, when you're on the spot and you're trying to answer things quickly, um, don't don't take me being overly critical. He, he Honestly, he probably did a better job than I could have done as an apologist, absent the Calvinism stuff. Um, if I think the Calvinism stuff causes you to stumble every time because I obviously think it's false. And so, um, I, well, I say I would have done is I, I would have done, I think I would, Joe, I'm sorry. I would have done a little better job than you did even I had some, I, I did I know that we don't have original manuscripts and things like that. I do have some uh, answers with regard to the flood and the age of the earth and those kinds of things. And so I, I, I will just say, I'm trying to be kind of gracious on that point, but, um, I understand when you're in the heat of a moment and you're being pressed on a hard argument sometimes it's a little difficult. And so I'm trying to give grace there for him because he did do a good job in handling himself and answering some of the questions I think he did okay with. But uh, the portions I've clipped out here, I think demonstrate really where Calvinism's theology is ultimately hindering his efforts. And you'll see why as I, th I think as we watch this. So let's, let's go back to it. I started thinking about the fact that if God was capable of drawing all people to himself, and if God was capable of revealing himself to each person in a way that he or she would know him, then the fact that not everyone knows God has to be because God chooses not to draw them. God chooses not to reveal himself. Now, most people would say it's a matter of free will if God you know, told everyone what they needed to know in order to come to believe that then there would be no free will choice. But I completely reject that argument. For a it's a biblically illiterate option. If you're trying because, to use the Bible, that doesn't work. Right. Yeah. I believe you're... Okay. And so instead of using as a defeater the free will argument, as I've seen some good Calvinist apologists do, if somebody's stuck on this particular point, use it as a defeater for an atheist... He just says, oh, it's illiterate. You know, those those free will advocates out there, you know, Frank Turek, William Lane Craig, uh, Braxton Hunter, Eric Hernandez, all the guys I just mentioned, plus every other non-Calvinistic apologist, they, they, they have, oh, man, they're illiterate, biblically illiterate. That's pretty much, he just kind of threw all of us free will advocates under the bus for the sake of an atheist argument. Um, let me teach you what defeaters are, okay? Defeaters are when you can say to somebody, 
you know, I have this belief, but I know of other Christians who don't believe like I do and still are Christians. Um, I even heard, y'all remember me playing this. It's been years ago. I need to go back and get it again because I think it's a good reminder. John Piper being asked by a lady about his Calvinism. By the way, thank you for the super chats. I'll get back to those. Um, and he's being pressed on his Calvinism and this lady saying, I, I can't be a Christian if this Calvinism stuff's true. If this theistic determinism stuff that you're teaching John Piper, if it's true, I, I, I have, I'm having to walk away from the faith. I can't swallow this pill. This is too hard. And Piper, to his credit, says, I would much rather be, find you in heaven as an, an Arminian than, than for you to abandon the faith altogether. And so he gives her, in a sense, permission not to become a Calvinistic Christian. And, you know, he may chalk that up to, you know, she's just not ready, not mature enough or whatever else that he, he, he might want to appeal to on, on that front. But, um, but at least he's willing to use it as a defeater and to say, in order to be a Christian, you don't have to be a Calvinist. Okay. And, and in the same way, if and I've heard Braxton Hunter talk about this, I believe it is, I don't put words in his mouth, but I've heard him talk about how he'll talk to somebody who's a very philosophically minded person who's a determinist at heart, you know, kind of a deterministic thinking type of person, you know, more of a, uh, you know, computer programmer type of individual, you know, and he just, and he was a, the other way. He was like, I can't believe in this free will stuff. I mean, obvious determinism just makes so much more sense to me. And he's going, guess what? There are Calvinists who are determinists and you can be a Christian and still hold to some form of determinism. And so what's Braxton Hunter doing? He's, he's using it as a defeater saying, you don't have to be my kind of Christian philosopher in the sense of what we hold to on this disputable matter of determinism in order to be a Christian. And what Joe does here, he just throws us all under the bus and says, yeah, that's just illiterate. Um, and instead of, instead of, I think the, the appropriate response would be, um, to say, well, actually, you know, that is a viable way in which Orthodox has interpreted the scripture. Orthodox, um, Christians have interpreted that, that way. And that is one defeater to answer your issues with regard to, if you're having a major hang up on free will, and if God wants to draw people to himself, he will. And so it, it's basically her saying what we've heard other people saying. We just recently played some others, uh, Megan Phelps, and there was another lady on a, a, a recent uh, YouTube video that was talking about how she, they walked away from Christianity because of Calvinism's unique claims about Christianity. And, and, and this, this lady seems to be doing much of the same thing. Now, she has other reasons, obviously, that she argues for. But one of her major hangups is what she just laid out there, the, the misunderstanding of John 6, 44, which, by the way, drawn by Jesus is out. Uh, my interpretation, exegesis of John 6, 44, and you can find a link there in the show notes on that as well if you're wanting more information about that. All right, let's continue on. Calvinist, is that correct? No. Oh, okay. People like to apply that label. That label is for people that don't understand church history. So if we'd like to say this, that John Calvin articulated the same things that Paul and Jesus in the early church believed when he fought the heresies of Jacobius Arminius with the Synod of Dort. If that's what we mean by Calvinism and articulation of the biblical truth, then sure, Calvin and I would agree on a lot of things. I would call myself reformed, which means I'm going to okay. hold the biblical thing. But okay. Calvinist would be someone that follows Jesus, follows John Calvin or believes Calvin because of what Calvin says, and that is not my situation at all. Okay, no Calvinist, nobody who even self-identifies as a Calvinist would say they follow John Calvin. Um, in other words, to call yourself a Calvinist is the same thing as to call yourself reformed in, in most circles. And so this is a way in which Calvinists sometimes try to remove the, the baggage of the name Calvinism because they know Calvinism may carry with it some negative connotations with their audience. I get it. I did the same thing. Um, but to call yourself reformed as if there were no non-Calvinistic people, a part of the reformation like, uh, Philip Melanchthon, um, and, and many others. And most of those who followed Philip Melanchthon, who taught differently than what, uh, Luther did with regard to Romans nine and other things as we've gone through. Um, and, and so that that's kind of a revisionist kind of way of history to make Calvinists seem more mainstream. If you're not a Catholic, if you're part of the Reformation, if you're part of those who, who came out of Catholicism, then you are truly a quote unquote Calvinistic, soteriologically Calvinistic reform theologian. And that's, that's a, again, a little bit of a revisionist way of looking at it in my estimation. Okay. I guess I should clarify what I really meant to ask is you believe that who is a believer and who is not believer 
is the sovereign choice of God, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, that'd be one of my main arguments with the perseverance of the saints argument is that belief is not, not the choice of man, it's the choice of God. Okay. If belief is not a choice of man, it is a choice of God, why do you do what you do? Because I mean, my heart God made me in the face. Okay, but you're never going to convince someone to believe in God because only God can do that. So what is the purpose of telling people about God if the only way they can come to believe is if God chooses to come and move them? Because any kind of evangelistic efforts, I have a 100% success rate for the kingdom of God. So either it is going to add to the condemnation of vessels prepared for wrath for destruction that will, God will use to glorify himself. So we'll be adding to the condemnation of unbelievers where God will be just and destroying them for eternity. Or he will use the preaching of the gospel in the way he primarily has, which is how he draws his elect to himself. So I have a 100% success rate with whatever I'm doing because I'm accomplishing God's purpose either way. You could also look at it and say you have a zero percent success rate because anything anyone that comes to God is was predestined to do so before you even existed, and what you had to do had nothing to do with it. Yes, God doesn't need me to do what He's going to do. It is a privilege and an honor to be used by the sovereign God to accomplish His purposes. I think the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I, I'm. Is that the chief end of every man, or just the elect men, Joe? Um, to, to say that you're preaching the gospel, you have a hundred percent success rate because for the reprobate that you're preaching to, you're increasing their condemnation. That just hurts me to the deepest core of my being. I just cannot fathom that someone would say to an atheist and an audience of people that I'm successful in my causing you to be even more condemned than you were born as a reprobate by teaching to you the gospel. That's the purpose of what I'm doing here. I, for If you're a reprobate, my purpose in being here is to bring heap, higher levels of condemnation upon you. Are you serious? People, do you see how when Calvinism is consistently applied, how damaging it is to the kingdom of God? and to evangelism efforts. That is absolutely, unequivocally, demonstrably false. The Bible never speaks of evangelism and preaching the good news, the good news, is somehow heaping higher condemnation upon those who God didn't choose in eternity past or who God ultimately reprobated in eternity past. And, and it, it very much comes across, and, I, and I'm sure I don't know his heart. I can't psychologize Joe here, the, the Calvinist, but he seems he doesn't seem to have any sort of compassion for these people. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have any kind of a, and again, I, I can't, I, 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 you know what? I'm not going to go there. I, I don't know. I don't know his heart, um, and I, I shouldn't say that. It just, it doesn't come across to me like he does. Maybe deep down he does. Everybody expresses emotions differently. Let's just be honest. Um, sometimes I come across as not being emotional about something or feeling about something, and and it's just because of the heat of the moment. So I I, I don't I I can't say what Joe's heart is. I don't know his heart, and so I, that's wrong for me to 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 say that he doesn't have a compassion for the lost. He may uh, have a great compassion for him. I have no idea. What I'm saying is the way in which you're expressing these things makes it sound like you don't. And therefore, you're affecting the way people are hearing you. And therefore, the people who are hearing you in this this lady, this granny, and the, her audience are hearing this kind of cold-hearted, I'm here and I'm 100% successful because if you're elect, I'm going to win you over. And if you're not, I'm heaping condemnation on you. That, that really does come across like, I really don't care so much about you. Um, and whether you intend to come across that way or not. You and I are both very religious for what we do. We just are on opposite sides and we have different religions. If you found out that God chose not to save one or more of your children, okay. how would you feel about that? It means he's God. See, God, God is a bigger being than I am. He's higher than I am. 
and I sure hope that God has chosen my children. And one of the assurances that I have that he most likely has is that he's placed them in my household to be raised under his admonition and nurture. But if God chooses not to save my children, that is his prerogative because he is God and I am not God. He decides who's in his heaven. He decides who's in his hell. Romans 9 is really clear about how God handles that. And because he's God and I'm not, I don't get to sit over him in judgment of that decision. That's his decision to make, not mine. So it's not only possible, but it's also very likely because the way is narrow and those that are chosen are few. Yes. It is very likely that at least one of your children is not among the chosen. That is possible, yes. And it is very likely that God predestined one of your children to an eternal torment in hell. That is possible. And you don't have a problem with that. Okay. We've got two ways to look at this. This is a glass half full or glass empty. Either I can rejoice that God chose a wretched sinner for salvation, which is me, or I can worry about God's choices with other wretched sinners. When I realize that the human nature and the human position against God is that I've sinned against an almighty God and that everyone deserves his judgment, I should be mystified, shocked, and stunned whenever he chooses anyone, not surprised when someone doesn't get chosen. Take a breath. Take a breath, Leighton. I've watched it twice preparing for this and it's still just, I mean, I, the, it feels like a sucker punch. It feels like, it feels like somebody just punched me in the gut hearing that. Um, and I'm trying, I'm trying not to react in emotion. I'm really not, I, I, but man, I, I have to pause. Okay. God help me. Um, Okay. Gather yourself, Leighton. All right. When when someone asks you a question that's obviously very emotional, um, very, very hitting home. I mean, your your children. I think this guy has a lot of children. Um and uh and it's very, very likely, as she's pointing out, that one of them is not elect. And is that is that, are you good with that? And of course he's he's God. And then, and then he goes on to explain from that vantage point that, you know, we should be shocked that God would even show mercy to one person, not shocked that he would condemn somebody because of how horrible and heinous we are. Is that, is that the message you get from Jesus in his life, that we should be shocked that he would be gracious to even one person? Honestly, after reading the Gospels, I would be shocked that he would not be gracious to even one person because of how gracious he is saying, teaching us to stop and help our enemies and to love one another and to give of ourselves and go the extra mile and dying on a cross for the sins of his enemies, the people who are condemning him, the people who hate him the most. And he's saying, forgive them, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I, I would be shocked to find out that Jesus doesn't show mercy or love for even one person. And yet Calvinism is teaching us, you should be shocked. You should be just absolutely baffled that God would show mercy to even one person. What? What Bible are you reading? The Bible teaches that God loves and shows mercy for God so loved the world that he gave his son. The whole message of the gospel is God loves you. He wants you. Yes, the chief end of man, to, to love God and glorify him forever. That's what he wants for every man, not just a select few that he arbitrarily picked before the foundation of the world or unilaterally picked, whatever word you prefer. Because God is love. Doesn't say God is wrath. God is love. And he loves that which he created. And he sent Jesus to demonstrate his love for the world. And he wants every single man, woman, boy, and girl to love him and glorify him forever, to know him. And he sent Jesus to help us to know him and to have a way of salvation because no one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And so... To say to this to this woman, one, I have a hundred percent success rate because if you're a reprobate, I'm here to heap burning coals on your head. I'm here to ultimately bring more condemnation on you by preaching you the good news, which is not really good for you at all. It's really bad news. Matter of fact, it's bad news for most people. If you happen to be one of the elect, then it's good news for you, but it's bad news for everybody else. Um I think that does such huge amount of damage to the gospel. 
and a huge amount of damage to our efforts as apologists and as evangelists. Um, and, and I think that's why we have to do better at standing up against the rise of Calvinism, because if it's not affecting this generation as much as you think it will, wait until the next generation and the next, because history repeats itself. And look at the effects of what higher and higher forms of Calvinism do to the church and do to apologetic and evangelistic fervor. And I think you'll begin to see really quickly why this kind of teaching, when consistently played out, and thank God, Many Calvinists don't consistently play out their theology as consistently as this guy does. But when you see it playing itself out in real world apologetic conversations and evangelistic conversations, you can begin to see how utterly damaging these kinds of beliefs are to the cause of Christ and to the, just the, the, those who are seeking things. Think about how many people in this audience who are just seeking to find clarity, maybe maybe struggling, maybe looking at both sides. And this is the representation of God they get. And that, that's why I think that this has to be this has to be confronted in love. Okay. The question I have for you is whether or not a person is saved was determined before the world even existed, correct? According to Ephesians and First Peter, yeah. Okay. There are other definitions, there are other interpretations of First Peter and Ephesians 1 than what the Calvinists have to offer. Uh, those would be defeaters. But again, he's going to hold hard his th particular theology of Calvinism, his particular interpretation of those passages as being theistic determinism. God has decided before they were born whether they're going to heaven or hell. So whether or not your children are saved is a decision that God made even before the earth existed, you know, you didn't exist. No one existed. Okay. So when your child was born, the day he was born, before he did anything good or bad, God already decided he either Esau is, he's an Esau that I love, or he's a, J a Jacob that I love, or he's an Esau that I hate. Correct? Yeah. Okay. So if a baby is... Notice he's not, he's not pushing back here. He, she, she just represented what Calvinism looks like. And he's just like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. That, that horrible, obviously heinous thing you just described of a baby being chosen for reprobation before he ever did anything good or bad. So in other words, what's more innocent than somebody who hadn't been created yet? Can, can, matter of fact, use your imagination. Imagine for me, anybody who's more innocent than an unborn baby, who's not even been conceived yet, for goodness sake never done anything bad by the definition. And yet you've got God condemning them to eternal hell before they do anything bad. This is why R.C. Sproul takes the foresight sin view. In other words, you have to take into consideration the fall. You have to foresee it. You have to foreknow what Esau will become and the sins in order to condemn him justly. That was R.C. Sproul's argument from his book that we went through, remember? Because some Calvinists aren't careful about that. They basically have God condemning the innocent. And R.C. Sproul comes down hard on the superlapsarians in his book that we went over, calling it, he's he, he, R.C. Sproul calls the superlapsarians far worse names than I do as far as calling them down, not names, but rebukes. He, re, he very hard rebuke on superlapsarians and how this comes across because God is condemning the innocent according to that definition of the way in which you're interpreting his text. And it's just absolutely absurd. Is born and it's an Esau baby. It dies and it goes straight to hell. Not because it sinned, but because God, that was God's sovereign choice. Correct? Also because God explains why man is responsible for his sin and being born with a sin nature because we were represented by Adam in the fall. But yes, that is the truth. Okay. So it's not any particular person's sin that subjects them to judgment, but rather it was the sin of Adam that brought judgment on the entire human race. And judgment isn't just judgment is, you know, every, everyone is under this punishment, whether they were good or not. But see, again, what we're doing is you're putting yourself in the judge's chair. You got to realize that God is bigger than us and God is just. He will make no decision that is unjust or unmoral. God is. How do you think they're going to come from?
Okay, so before we move on, let me let me let me uh, point you back to the last couple of episodes we've done going over uh, conditional imputation and an, uh, an interpretation of Romans five, even from some reformed scholars that does not hold to the concept of original guilt, meaning we are we are inherently guilty because of what Adam did, um, and that there are actually scholars throughout Christian history who have rejected the inherited guilt concept, this concept and idea that you're born guilty because of what Adam did. Um, and there's very strong explanation as to why that is and how there's a better explanation. The age of accountability arguments that we've talked about are all better arguments. Even the softer Calvinists like a MacArthur and Piper and others who do hold to uh, age of accountability um, that, that, that a child is innocent until they reach an age of accountability where they make a moral, uh, cognizant choice to reject the things of God and to reject what they know of God. Um, they are not held guilty. They're not held culpable for what Adam did, the sins of their parents, Ezekiel 18, 20, but they're held culpable for what they do with the words of God, John 12. I did not come to condemn the world. What will judge you on the final day? The very words that I've spoken to you will judge you. Uh, as, as Paul said, that they, they, are, they perish because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved, which implies that they could have loved the truth so as to be saved. But because they suppress the truth, re they reject the truth, that is why they perish. They don't perish because they were born under Adam. They don't perish because they sin too much. They perish because they refused the truth, the revelation. Uh, no man has an excuse, Romans 1. All have been made known the truth of who God is. And if you reject that truth, if you walk away from that truth, if you suppress that truth and you grow defiled, God has every right as a judge to give you over to your defiled heart and way. Uh, and, your, and, and to those who are faithful with a little, God will bring more light, more revelation. But to those who reject the little amount of light, he doesn't owe you more light, more revelation. If you continue to reject him and to suppress the truth and the light, the revelation that he brings, that's your fault. And therefore, you're under condemnation justly because you have rejected his truth, not because God rejected you before he created you or created you to be a, a reprobate, to just demonstrate his wrath upon you from the foundation of the world or something ridiculous like that, that the Bible absolutely never teaches. God. So if he's made that decision, he made the right decision. Okay. Let's Another thing, notice how she's just kind of laughing there. And it, it's because obviously, and she's a, she she grew up in the church. I mean, she talks about how she was a part of the church and she was uh, she served in every facet of the church and all these kinds of things. So she's well versed in Christianese and those kinds of things. And she's kind of laughing at this because it, it kind of comes back to that argument that we've made with regard to uh, the quote from C.S. Lewis that if when when we're bringing judgments uh, about God and these kinds of things, and we 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 come to this conclusion that His black is our white and our white is His black, His good is our evil, our evil is good. Then we can say we 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 know not what we worship because he he might he might as well be an all powerful demon for all we know we we can't know what's good or what's evil if 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 you draw these conclusions out to their their logical ends and he even goes on to say depravity uh, total depravity as taught by Calvinism ultimately it can lead to a form of devil worship in that way because you've got God being painted in this horrible bad light that's intuitively against all things that are just or right. Um, which is obviously what this godless granny is seeing. It's obvious what most people see before they swallow the hard pill of theistic determinism. And therefore they're like, okay, I'm willing, I'm willing to serve this God who is demonstrably acting as if he's unjust by every reasonable means of justice, reasonable means of goodness. And yet I'm still willing to sacrifice my own children and I'm going to still worship him. That's what the whole ball gate started with was Warren trying to make that point that this mindset that people have to say, I'm willing to worship a God who would condemn my child before he's ever born, before he's done anything bad to an eternity in hell. And I'm still willing to worship and give my life to following this God. That that's, that's the whole surrendering your sense making the whole, this whole concept of no matter what anybody says about God in my little echo chamber, this necessarianism, this um, this 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 concept of an idea of um, that that because he's God, he necessarily must be doing what's right, even if somebody in my echo chamber is telling me something that's obviously heinously evil. I'm going to still accept it. Oh, but it's right because God did it, and there, therefore, there's no line that somebody can cross in that worldview that ultimately says what God is doing 
there is unjust, is wrong, because whatever God does, even if what you're claiming is false, I'm going to say is just because God did it, versus looking at what the actual text of Scripture teaches about the law of God. The law of God reveals the character of God. And so when you when you have the law of God telling us not to condemn the innocent and, and all the other rules and regulations that the law reveals about the character of God, you see that that it's not just based upon our intuitions or what we feel is right emotionally. It's based upon the revelation of Scripture, of what God says is right and wrong. And, and that's one of the reasons the second book that I wrote, God's Provision for All, really gets into that. If you want to go deeper into the defense of the goodness of God, uh, what about those who never hear the the teachings of Jesus in particular? Or what about those, um, you know, uh, different questions about, uh, you know, babies that die and the the flood and and uh, and some of the questions of the Old Testament uh, scriptures? Um, this gets into that and and kind of helps answer some of those questions from from our perspective and understanding why we do believe God's good because he's recognizably good. He's demonstrably good. We don't just say he's good because we're afraid to get, you know, he's going to smite us if we don't say he's good. We, we actually believe he's good. His character demonstrates his goodness. Uh, his choices demonstrate his goodness. And, and we don't have to be ashamed of that. We don't have to hide from that. We don't have to be embarrassed about that. And I, th I think that we have to keep coming back to the, the truth of God's goodness and, and, and helping people to understand that goodness is demonstrable. It's recognizable because God's given us a conscience by which we can know right from wrong. Um, and so that conscience is something that God gives us. And therefore, it should be something that guides us to truth. The law guides you to Christ and your need for Christ. So too, the conscience written on your heart, it's, it's equated by Paul to the law. It's guiding us to Christ by showing us the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. Let's go to Adam. Okay. So God knew let me that explain he... Adam really quickly on that one because we were talking about the justness. And I think J.C. Ryle was the one that said, you don't have to like the way God governs his universe, but until you get to tell him what to do, you have to have your own universe. And since you don't have your own universe, we have to deal with God's universe. And so since it's his universe, he set up the rules, he did his way. And he decided that Adam represented us as our federal head. And when Adam chose to sin, all of humanity was represented in that fall and bears responsibility for it. But we're also doing a big... That also contradicts other things in the Bible. And that's why I want to talk about the mistake we're making here. We're smashing together the levels of God's... And this is where I'm, I'm agreeing with her. The things that he's saying about federal headship and this imputation of guilt from birth contradicts other things that the Bible teaches. And she's recognizing that. Ezekiel 18.20, for example, and many others that we just went over in previous episodes that I'll, I'll point you to go back and watch. Um, th that's the whole point. She's seeing this blatant contradiction and she's recognizing it based upon what she knows about Jesus and what she knows about the scriptures versus what this Calvinist is claiming from a fairly unique interpretation of John chapter, uh, Romans chapter five, excuse me, um, with regard to the Latin translation that was introduced by Augustine. And that translation is, has led many people to misinterpret the scriptures to a point where, again, God's not demonstrably just. It's not recognizably good. And, and that's why atheists, they see that. And it's like Calvinists are confirming what many of the atheists are claiming. God's demonstrably evil. God's recognizably unjust. And the Calvinist is kind of coming along going, yeah, but who are you to question God? And if you want your own universe, you can go do it better. But our God's going to do what he's going to do. And that's kind of their, their apologetic. That's their answer to it. And it's a very bad apologetic as far as I'm concerned. What, where God's at and where we're not, where we're at. So it's like the H, I, I like Doug Wilson's question. When Hamlet says to be or not to be, who's speaking? Hamlet or Shakespeare? And the answer is, it depends on how I'm looking at the play. On one level, Shakespeare wrote the play. On a whole nother level, Hamlet is being a character and he's making his decisions and doing what he's doing. And I think a lot like the mathematics. Hamlet is a figment of Shakespeare's imagination. He's not a real sentient thinking being. There's a lot of ways in which that analogy falls short. I have a response video to Doug Wilson on his Hamlet uh, illustration, author, uh, you know, character analogy. It's, it's just another form of puppeteering. Uh, Avatar worlds, um, you've got the author doing exactly, uh, I mean, the, the character in the book doing exactly what the author has written that he will do. And it's just another form of theistic determinism in which uh, it gives an analogy of saying, well, Hamlet can't question uh, Shakespeare. Well, he can if the if Shakespeare authors him to, 
And so if anybody who questions the author is being authored by the author to question the author, which again, it just makes it nonsense. Theistic determinism falls apart on itself. Radical idea of flatland, where you would have a two-dimensional world and you could not explain to people in a two-dimensional world what it would be like to be in a three-dimensional world. Much like that, we arrogantly assume that we're in the three-dimensional world and we can decide what it's like when really we're the flatlanders. God has dimensions outside of time that he understands that we do not understand. And so it's very arrogant for me to assume that I can make a judgment on how God has operated his universe when Oh, sorry, just saw our chat. Again, of me to decide how God makes his universe when I'm not the one who made the universe and he gets it. Y'all recognize this. This is the whole flattening it out. You know, uh, you don't understand. You're making it all flat. Well, there's no more flat system than a determinism. And so to say you're flattening it out means uh, ultimately to say, yes, everything you just said is true. And all the reasons that you're rejecting Christianity that you just said are basically true, but you're flattening it out. It's more multi-diamond shaped. In other words, you really don't understand. If you really understood it, then you would accept it. Um, and what that really means is if you just swallowed the difficult pill, this paradoxical antinomy, this, this contradiction that God is good while determining evil, and that God is good and, and you're responsible, even though he's ultimately the one who's responsible for what you res, your response is. If you're just willing to swallow that pill, if you're just willing to, to, to adopt our double think, then you would understand, then, then it would be multi-diamond shaped, multi-orb shaped, and these kinds of things. And it's not, it's, not a, it's not a logical or cogent answer whatsoever. And how do you know that you have the right one? Maybe, you know, th that's why I brought this comment up. Maybe you have the wrong religion. Maybe you're worshiping the wrong God and the real God is angry with you. Okay, and I, I, I left that one in there because that's true. If even Calvinism is true, that's what we talked about with the uh, evanescent grace of Calvin, that the people who believe think they believe in God but really aren't believing in God. And the reason that they think they believe in God, according to John Calvin, is because God gave them this temporary faith, this, this seeming faith but not real faith, fake faith. Because God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, which would include the what the Matthew 7 people, or is it Matthew 5, where they say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or perform any miracles? And they'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. They obviously thought they were Christians. They thought they were following God. And why would they think that if God didn't decree it? So God decrees people to think they're following him when they're really not. How do you know you're not one of those people? You couldn't know it. There's no way you could know whether God has given you a fake faith or a real faith until you get to glory. And when you stand before the judgment seat, you're going, God, I'm ready to enter in the glory. You know, where, where's my well done, good and faithful servant? He says, ah, actually, you're one of the ones that I gave that fake faith to. See ya. H how do you worship a God that you th is not trustworthy, who doesn't really want your well-being and may not want your well-being? If he's the kind of God that would do that to some people, how do you know he's not doing it to you? And th that's exactly why these kinds of questions, I think, destroy Calvinistic apologists. Okay. I do want to revisit one small thing, and it was it's just a word of caution that I wish to give to you, and that is don't let your children ever see this stream. Okay. Don't let your children ever know that you're okay with them being tortured for eternity. Okay. <clears throat> and why is I, that? Because I think it would be emotionally damaging to them. Wouldn't you feel hurt knowing that your parents are okay with you being tortured? Don't you, don't you think that would be very hurtful to them? I think it depends on your understanding of God and your bigness of God. And I think that God, being an intelligent designer of the universe and having the right to do with his creation as he will, makes a lot more sense than an atheist worldview. This has nothing to do with God. This has to do with your relationship with your children and oh. how your children feel about how, you know, do, are you a loving and protecting parent? If you as a parent feel that, you would hand your child over to someone to be tortured. That's going to make your children feel oh, very this is emotionally a, this is unstable. Of who I, this is a question of who I trust more. Now, am I okay if someone, some person on the horizontal level wants to mess with my kids? Absolutely no. But on the vertical level, am I okay with God doing with his creation as he pleases? I 100% am. And why do you think I would evangelize my children and tell them the good news of the gospel, hoping that God would draw them to himself and they'd be elect? Like I said, we're combining the two levels of God's sovereignty and trying to make them even, and that doesn't really work because God is sovereign and man has responsibility. But this is, by the way, what Warren McGrew was talking about when he talked about the mindset issue, that I'm willing to worship a God, hand my child over 
or torment and still worship him. Um, that, that's the same mindset as those who are putting their, their uh, offering, their children's offering to a false deity or whatever it may be. It's the same mindset. Not the same, they're saying exactly the same in every way or that he doesn't want his child to obviously believe. He obviously loves his children, wants them to believe. But it's the mindset to say, I'm willing to believe in a God who would do this. And, and this is what the godless granny is pushing back against. I mean, any parent would fight to their death to say, no, don't let this, don't let this happen. Um, I, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give anybody the chance to just torture my child or just to take my child. Um, I I'm going to step in and I'm going to, to stand up for my child and the protection of my child. Now you say, okay, well, which do you trust more? Do you trust your child to his own salvation more than you trust God? And that, that's the question I used to push back when I was a Calvinist. I would say, well, do, who do you really trust? Because it's that kind of that pious answer. It's forcing an answer. They have to say God. They have to say, I would rather trust God. But the, the true question is, which form of God would you rather trust? The one who really loves every person that he created and desires their salvation and sent Jesus to die for a way of their atonement? Um, that that form of God? Because yes, that that's the form of God. I would, I would want him to being the, the one who's in charge of my, my children's salvation because he actually wants my child to be saved and has provided a way for that to happen, okay? What, what I don't trust is the kind of God, or I would not want to trust my children to the kind of God who would reprobate most of humanity before the foundation of the world for the praise of his own glory uh, in order to demonstrate his justice or to demonstrate his power over them or something of that nature. Um, it, it, I would not want to entrust my children to a deity like that. That's why I'm not surrendering my sense making. I'm not willing to put my child on the pyre, as Warren was saying. I'm not willing to go there. It, it, it's it's exactly what um, Roger Olson was talking about with uh, Michael Horton, a, a Calvinist friend of his, and they were having that debate. And somebody was saying, you know, you talk about God being monstrous on Calvinism. This that's the end. He's kind of critiquing him, and 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 Roger Olson, Doctor. Olson, to his credit, was saying, listen, I'm not trying to say that that my Calvinist friend, Michael Horton, believes God's monstrous and, and, and teaches that God's monstrous. I'm just saying to you, I can't get there. I, I, my, my, my mind, whatever, maybe God determined my mind to be this way, whatever it is, I cannot surrender my sense-making. I cannot give my children over on the pyre um, and, and, and still choose to worship a God who I believed would be that way. I, I can't choose to give my allegiance to a God that I believe would do those kinds of things. I, in other words, if I became a Calvinist, I would have to believe God's monstrous, and therefore I can't adopt Calvinism. And I reject Calvinism because I believe the logical ends of the system leads to a monstrous view of God. And that's the point we're trying to make, is that we're not trying to say, at least I'm not, that because you're a Calvinist, therefore you believe God's monstrous and you don't care about your children and all these kinds of crazy things that people can come out and make it sound like we're, we're accusing you of. What we're trying to say is that consider the, the possibility that your interpretation of those three major texts are wrong. Or just even Romans 9, for goodness sake. If Romans 9 doesn't teach Calvinism, then you have no apologetic for Calvinism. You really don't. Let's just be frank about it. And so if you just have a wrong interpretation Think about what kind of view of God you've asked the world to adopt. Even Calvinists like Piper and, and Sproul and others describe how difficult this pill is. The whole concept of double predestination, reprobation, the whole concept of God uh, unilaterally making choices to condemn or to save people before they even done anything bad. Um, all of those kinds of issues, the whole superlapsarian controversies and all that come along with it. All of that baggage, all of that hard, difficult stuff is, is what's packed into this, this systematic way of thinking. What if it's wrong? Ask yourself that. What if it's wrong? What if I've interpreted this passage wrong? And think about the damage it's doing for these people who are the average layperson, the average person out there looking in to the window of Christianity and going, what's in here? Let, let me seek this out. Let me figure this out. Let me understand this. I want to I want to figure these truths out. I want to know what this religion's saying versus this religion and these atheists are saying versus these Christian authors. And they're peeking into our world and they're seeing your depiction of Christianity, your depiction of God as 
ultimately choosing to reprobate babies before they do anything bad and all the things that you've heard said by Joe here and and they're peeking in and they're going ugh man mormonism does look pretty good compared to that oh yeah allah well kind of looks similar on some forms of M muslim teaching and i don't want to have anything to do with that in other words if free will is true and you're wrong, folks, think about what you're doing to people. You're dissuading them from our God. And so that's what I'm just saying. Boy, you better make sure you're right about this. Because if you happen to have interpreted Romans 9 wrongly, and there are numerous, even among the Reformed tradition, interpretations of Romans 9, in other words, it's not a cut and dry doctrine as, as much as people like to paint it as, could you be wrong? And how is that affecting your evangelism and your apologetics? And how is it affecting the way the world sees Christ? That's what you have to ask yourself. Both of those things can be true at the same time. But also, I need to provide them with a worldview that provides an intelligent basis for things like logic and reasonable thought and giving them some sort of order to their world. And in an atheist worldview... I don't think telling your children that they are garbage, that they are worthless, that they are deserving of nothing but torture and death is good for them. I think and that yet, is very damaging. And yet that is what the atheists purport. So how is that any better than what we say? Is it an atheist position that, that children should be tortured? Where, where in the atheist view is there a torture chamber for children? So notice what he's forced to do here. He's like, well, yeah, Calvinism sounds really, really bad, but yours is worse. <laughs> That's the best he can do. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's like if, he, if he's debating with a Muslim, then he could be like, okay, yeah, um, our form of God is basically the same. Theistic determinism is true on both factors, at least on some forms of uh, Muslim tradition. Um, but but your religion is worse because of this, this, and this. I mean, you, we don't see Christians flying planes into buildings, at least. So you should adopt our worldview. Um, it's like, okay, which is the worst of the two evils versus... I want you to know our God and his goodness and he's glorious and he's demonstrably just and right and loving and pure and holy. And you want to magnify him, not compare which of the worst evils you're going to, it's like our election coming up. Which of the, which of the two evils do I vote for? And it's kind of like, it's what your apologetic becomes. Which of these two things do I vote for that are both demonstrably evil, demonstrably false recognizably unjust, and which of the two would I rather adopt? So Richard Dawkins says, there is no such thing as good or bad, just blind, pitiless indifference. There's absolutely no moral code that can be founded upon in the atheist worldview. There are no morals. I disagree. No okay, and so they go on to do the moral argument, and he, he's ultimately based the whole concept and idea that if we have moral right and wrong, then he kind of goes into that. And a, a lot of those things are the same kinds of th arguments that you'll hear from a classical apologist as well, as far as the moral argument. Even there's a uh, argument there at reasonable faith that I mentioned before on the moral argument, and there's some truth in, the, in those things. But how do you argue for the moral argument when you ultimately are teaching that everything that's immoral in our world is decreed unchangeably by our God? It undermines the moral argument. And, and this is what I'm saying. This is why Calvinism fails to do good apologetics because everything it does undermines the arguments of good apologists, from what I can tell. Uh, we, we looked at this before. I just want you to see one more time. Somebody was mentioning this and didn't, didn't know what I was referring to, but it was this young lady that was on a TikTok recently. And uh, Braxton Hunter actually did a, a video with me as a guest going over this. Um, and I think it's just got, came out real recently as well that you can go watch, but I'll, I'll briefly put it up here. The first passage I want to talk about is from Romans 9, which was the starting point of my deconstruction journey. Up until the point that I read and studied and chewed on the words in Romans 9, I believed in a God who created all people, gave them free will, and that he wanted all people to be saved, but he couldn't violate their free will to save them. And that it was the most loving thing he could do to give people freedom. And within that freedom, they could either choose him and go to heaven or they could reject him and go to hell. And that would be entirely their choice. I was an evangelist, so I believed in going out into my communities, spreading the word, trying to win as many souls as possible because 
I looked around and there were people going to hell and I didn't want that to happen. But when I was 17 years old, I was introduced to the concept of Calvinism. And when I was introduced to this, I said, no way. There's no way that God created people just to go to hell. And then I read Romans 9. How can the clay question the potter and ask, why have you made me like this? It says, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? If he has decided he wants to create you just to destroy you, then he's going to do that. And that's his right. You don't get to question that. And realizing this changed everything about my perspective of God. Realizing this made me see a God who did not desire people to be saved, but instead creates people as puppets, does what he wants with them, and then tells them you're not allowed to question it. That is just in direct contradiction to any kind of a loving, kind um, father God that I was taught growing up in the church. So I was fed one version of God who was a loving father, but I'm learning about this completely different God um, who intentionally creates people to go to hell. That right there really shattered my perception of God. It really caused me to start this journey of, of questioning what I believed and why I believed it. Now she has an atheist YouTube channel convincing people not to trust in God. Um, if anybody knows who that young lady is, I'd love to send her a copy of my book. Um, if for no other reason, I'll send her a video too. So if she doesn't want to read, she, he, she can just listen. But it gives her an uh, alternate uh, explanation of Romans 9 that does not uh, come to a Calvinistic, deterministic conclusion as she's obviously been falsely taught. I know this is hard, guys. I know I know. listening to this stuff. I know if you're a Calvinist, you're chomping at the bit to tear me up one side and down the other. I get it. Um, because you, you want to defend your doctrines and what you hold to is true. I understand it. Um, but I, I just want to plead with you, what if you're wrong? Just, just back away just one second and say, what if I have misinterpreted these basic four basic passages, three, four basic passages, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I've gotten something wrong and think about the damage you might be doing if you are. It, it, Cause honestly, if I'm wrong, let's just face it. If I'm wrong as you, I've the free thinking argument from Tim Stratton and JP Moreland puts this out there. If I'm wrong, it's because God determined for me to interpret his word wrongly. Okay. He's determined my sensibilities and my intuition to be such that I can't adopt Calvinistic theology and still worship him. He's determined me to be that way just like he did with Roger Olson and other non-Calvinist Christians throughout history. C.S. Lewis, Tozer, um, most Christians, as a matter of fact, throughout Christian history have not a adopted a five-point Calvinistic system systematic way of thinking uh, of soteriology. Um, why did he determine for all of us to misinterpret the Bible? And so either I'm right in, in defending the justice and goodness of God, or God has determined me to be wrong for the praise of his glory. So I feel pretty safe in where the, the boat I'm in here. And I just have to ask Cal Calvinist, are you feeling pretty safe in your boat? Um, because what if you're wrong? What if you've misinterpreted these texts? How is that affecting others? Before we close, I want to acknowledge our super chats. Thank you for those. Uh, Chupi, thank you for your super chat. Hey, Dr. Flowers, can you please explain Psalm 105.25 from your perspective? It kind of threw me for a loop. Thank you for your ministry. Um, I don't have my Bible app open and ready for that at the moment. And so uh, let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Um, and it may be one of those things if I get to it here. I think I know which one this is, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I, I don't, I, I may. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he turned, or let me put this up on the screen so that you can all see it. Um. Here we are. Okay. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, who had his chosen. Um, turned their heart to hate his people. Um, I think that's in reference to Pharaoh. Causes people to be very fruitful. Israel came to Israel. Okay, let me just back up here. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people sent him free. He made the Lord of his house, the ruler over all his possessions, to imprison his princes at will, that he might teach his elders wisdom. Israel also came into Egypt. Thus Jacob sojourned to the land of Ham, and he caused his people to be very fruitful and made them even stronger than their adversaries. 
he turned their hearts to hate his people. I guess he's referring to the, his enemies, their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, Aaron. Um, you got to remember when, when God hardens somebody or turns their heart to hate or to do something in that way, oftentimes there's figures of speech in scripture. Um, we've talked about this before. We're like the White House put Iraq into shambles. Does it mean that literally uh, the president went and started cutting off heads and burning down buildings in Iraq? Iraq. It means he pulled out the troops and allowed the Iraqi people to freely do what they're going to do. And so that's a form of a metonymy. I think it's what's it called, a figure of speech to say that by allowing people to do things freely, then all these things happen, but you accredit to the person who pulled out his hand of protection. So that's a, a figure of speech, for example. I'm not necessarily saying that that's what's happening here, but when when you're uh, talking about hardening somebody, it's, it's not necessarily a hardening for uh, unilateral, unconditional reasons. There can be a conditional hardening. In other words, the hardening is conditioned upon the fact that they rebelled on the fact that they continually rebelled. Um, giving them over their defiled mind, as Romans 1 says, is a conditional act. Because you traded the truth in for lies, then God, after showing you patience, after long-suffering, he gave you over. And so this can be an act of judgment upon God's part to say, okay, they've rejected my revelation, they've rejected my truth, they've rejected my grace, now I'm going to turn their heart to go this way. I'm going to let them go their own way is another way of putting it. Uh, to strengthen somebody in their resolve is what hardening literally means. And so when you see passages like this that seem to be accusing God of causing the evil, you need to read the context and understand certain figures of speech to say that really just means God let them go their own way. He released them to their own evil desires. He strengthened them in their resolve to do their evil so as to bring about his purpose of redemption and goodness through their rebellion. Um, again, I, I didn't look at the entire context of that verse, so don't don't hold me to that as uh, as a full exegesis of that passage or anything of that nature. But just based upon um, what I'm reading uh, firsthand, there, um, I, I think that that's basically what that's explaining. So hopefully that that helps, Shippy. Appreciate your super chat. Full Metal Maverick says, would love to see a live debate of Leighton versus one of the atheists that Psy has taken on. The irony is that even in that debate, Leighton will probably make it about how bad Calvinism is. LOL, he's obsessed. Um, one is, there's often the perception of, which I've talked about, uh, the, of me being obsessed with Calvinism or with uh, Calvinistic sociology because I've created this broadcast to address this issue. And I understand that. I, I can see how that can come across that way, even to well-intending people who maybe even like me. You know, there may be even family members, people who love me very much. They go, oh, Leighton's getting obsessed with this thing because he created this website. And it, it's kind of like, I, I, I try to liken it to, you know, uh, there's been different analogies that I've given. You know, if a sociologist uh, is somebody who's a doctrine of sociology, that's their that's their major field of study. That's what I wrote my dissertation on. Uh, I was a former as a former Calvinist. This is something that I've written a lot on, and so I created this on a a side uh, ministry in order to address it, so it doesn't affect what I do with my other ministries, whether it was with Texas Baptist as an evangelist and an apologist, or now as an, a professor of, of theology with Trinity. Um, I created it on a different platform to keep it from interfering with more significant, important ministries that, that, I, that I consider as important. And so people see that and they think, oh, that's all he does. It's like if you if you were a, a Dallas Cowboy fan, for example, and you created a Dallas Cowboy webpage and you you wanted to sell merchandise and you were really good at making merchandise and you you put it out on the side and and, you, and everybody saw, oh, this guy's obsessed with the Cowboys. My gosh, he's, like, he's so obsessed with the Cowboys. But you didn't see the other part of his life that he's actually uh, in his real life uh, quote unquote, he's he's a professor, or he's this, he's that, he's that. He does uh, fifteen other things that he spends his life on, but a few hours a week he spends it on the Cowboys um, fan page, and uh, as as a fan of the Dallas Cowboys, and so you think he's obsessed because he has a page dedicated to a particular issue or a particular thing, and so that that's why I think things like this come across as like, oh, he's so obsessed with Calvinism. If he was in any conversation with an atheist somewhere, he would bring up Calvinism. I've been in a lot of conversations with unbelievers and I can't think of one time I've ever brought up Calvinism. In fact, only time I ever bring up Calvinism is if they bring it, bring it up like this lady does here in this, uh, this video. If, if they bring up objections to Christianity based upon Calvinistic claims, I'll go, actually, you know what? There's really strong beliefs 
from Christians that don't believe Romans 9's teaching that, and, and I will bring it up if they do, but very rarely will I bring up um, issues of sociology or differences of sociology when I'm talking to another believer. But I can understand why somebody might think that if all they know about me is through this particular website, through Sociology 101. Um, Dylan, thank you for your super chat. Uh, it says, Leighton, thank you for everything you do. I have a lot of friends that are Calvinist. And I'm writing a paper to pass out to a Calvinist Bible study group and to give to their pastor. Would you critique or forward my paper? Um, Dylan, I'm, I'm not sure I um, will be able to do that in a timely manner. Um, <laughs> people uh, send me uh, books quite regularly. And by the way, I, I'm not complaining about this whatsoever. Um, many of the books and things that I've been sent, I've appreciated some of them. I've actually got, had the time to read because I was able to. But there's a pile of books that I was like, oh, I'd like to have time to get to that one. Not to mention the books that I pick up and still have yet to read. The books that are sent to me, I'll get one or two a month uh, sent to me by somebody. And it's like, yeah, can you read this? And I was like, oh man, I don't know when I'm, my time schedule I'm going to get for those things. Um, and I'm not trying to put you off, Dylan, by any means. Um, I, if if you can reach out through uh, Caleb, uh, Caleb Garza, Garza kind of helps uh, manage uh, all the the information coming in. And so if you want to reach out through, uh, through the website then I might be able to have time to do that. Um, I'm actually about to be traveling, be out of town for a couple of weeks, but, um, but it, depending on how, how fast you're needing to turn around, I might be able to, to look at that. And I'd also recommend Dylan, um, if you go to the sociology 101 Facebook page, um, I know Dr. Brian Wagner engages there along with a lot of other really good provisionists that if you posted your some of your arguments through Facebook there, you'd get some really fast feedback. Um, there's several there who are uh, admins. I, usually people I, who I added as admins do a really good job of representing what I believe uh, as a provisionist. And so some of them may be able to get a quicker turn uh, turnaround and give you some feedback on some of the things that you're doing. And so ho hopefully that that's helpful. Uh, Rambo, thank you for your super chat. Your ministry is an absolute blessing. Your passion, God given to those uh, to, on these issues, is fuel to dismantling the Calvinistic machine. I appreciate that, Rambo. Thank you for your for your super chat. Um, Daniel writes this: um, Please don't slide down into Pelagianism and act like Adam's sin has no effect on the rest of humanity, except for being a bad example. Okay. Well, one Daniel, I would I would really recommend that you go back and listen to my last broadcast where I walk through conditional imputation. Um, also, I would type in the term Pelagianism there at Sociology 101 and read the different uh, articles about what actual Pelagianism is from Dr. David Allen and Adam Harwood, both explaining what actual Pelagianism is historically versus what I believe and teach. Um, I would also uh, remind you to, 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 to represent what we're saying correctly. Um, I've never said that Adam's sin has no effect on the rest of humanity. Um, I've, I've actually talked about how we are cast out of the garden, that there is, <coughs> excuse me, illness and other things, uh, right on cue, um, that, that come from the fall, um, uh, labor pains, obviously the toiling of the soil that we are cast out of the garden, dead in our sins and trespasses, meaning that we're separated from God due to our rebellion. Like the prodigal was said to be dead, but now he's alive. So you're cast out of, of fellowship with God and, and God therefore can bridge the gap by you draw near to God in order to have fellowship with him. And so, yes, there's a huge amount of impact that obviously the fall has caused upon us. The one thing that I don't believe it's caused is us for, for us to be born guilty for what Adam did and and with that and and this inability concept that we can't respond positively to to the incarnation and to the gospel calling us to reconciliation from our fallenness that that's that that's uniquely what i reject and and i demonstrate also the the mass uh, numbers of uh historians uh and, and scholars throughout history of the christian faith who have rejected those same concepts and why they've rejected them. And so the the tendency is, is that when a Calvinistic, um, and again, throughout the seminaries of the last, my lifetime at least, um, three, four, five decades have been predominantly orchestrated by Calvinistic theologians. And a lot of the theologians that are the Wayne Grudems of the world, that the, the Wayne Grudem systematics are almost in every single Southern Baptist seminary as a required reading, that, that's Calvinism, okay? And so you, if, Daniel, you're raised being taught theologically from a more Calvinistic-leaning way of thinking, then you're automatically indoctrinated to believe that anybody who doesn't agree with your concepts of inherited guilt must be, i.e., 
heretic or semi-heretic, Pelagian. And the whole label there is slapped on somebody versus having a discussion. And the revisionist history steps in and they begin to revise history to make it sound like everybody's always just believed this. And if you don't, you're just a gross heretic. Um, and if you go back and actually study these things and look at those who disagree with some of the mainstream Calvinistic leaning historians or theologians that are predominantly uh, controlling our seminaries today, you'll begin to see that you might have been misled. And so I'm just pushing you to study for yourself. Be a good Berean. Don't surrender your sense making over to whatever seminary you happen to go to and whatever they happen to tell you, because that's oftentimes the label dismiss mentality comes from just being indoctrinated into a revisionist reworking of the way history actually played itself out and what actually happened throughout history. So let me just encourage you to keep studying. Uh, I understand where you're coming from. I very likely would have written those exact same words to myself if I were watching myself back in my 20s. Um, would, and I'm not saying you're in your 20s, but when I was in my 20s, I believed exactly what you're saying, and I would have accused myself of the exact same thing. Um, Jess, thank you for your super chat. Can you recommend a book or videos on prayer for a friend coming out of Calvinism and wants to understand how we relate to a non-deterministic God? Boy, good book on prayer. Um well, there, well, Ronnie Rogers did write a book on prayer um, and addressing the whole Calvinistic thing. So type in Ronnie Rogers um, at, uh, matter of fact, let me just, Ronnie, Ronnie recently um, uh, endorsed my book, Drawn by the Father. And uh, I have had um, him on um, to talk about this book as well. So you can probably look back and just type in the term Ronnie Rogers. Um, if only you would have asked, uh, praying God's conditional promises is the book. Um, let me put it on the screen for you. Share this tab instead. There it is right there. Ronnie Rogers. If only you would ask praying God's conditional promises, Dr. Ronnie Rogers. And so, um, it is there on Amazon. Highly recommend this book. It's pretty deep. I mean, he Ronnie always writes at a pretty deep level, um, but it's really, really good too. So highly recommend that book if you're uh, you're looking for a good book on prayer that kind of addresses these issues. And for a former Calvinist, somebody coming out of Calvinism, Ronnie was a Calvinist for longer than I was, 20, 30 years. I can't remember, 40 years maybe even. Um, and uh, he has a really good perspective that that I highly recommend. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Aaron Pearson, thank you for your super chat. Before you say anything bad about someone, we should walk a mile in their shoes because that way you're a mile, uh, you're a mile away and you have their shoes. <laughs> Sounds like deep thoughts by Jack Handy for those old enough who remember <laughs> those. That's funny. Okay, Sar uh, Sergeant Rock, thank you for your super chat. Um, Leighton's teachings, if nothing else, greatly helps potential deconstructionists find biblical teachings to push back on the evils of determinism. It removes that crutch many have otherwise leaned on. Yeah, and this this is hope, my hope, is that um, that some people who are find, trying to find an excuse to reject Christianity, and there are a lot of atheists out there trying to, because sometimes people don't want their, their behaviors are not lining up with their beliefs, and they're looking for a, an excuse not to be accountable to God, and not to be responsible to what he calls us to. And if they can find a good reason to reject the God of the Bible, then they'll they'll jump on it. And, and some of them have found a, a good reason, i.e. the Calvinistic claims, to walk away from their Christian faith and from uh, the, the, uh, the, the truth of what the gospel teaches. And that that's that's devastating to me because I hate, to, I hate to see that happening. Um, I was trying to, doggone it. I look back, I, I, I was looking up and thinking, you know, I'm going to get, keep this one under an hour and I'm already at an hour and 20 minutes, man, time flies, but I will go ahead and break it in, to an end. And I appreciate those who support on a regular basis. Again, check out trinitysim.edu if you're looking for a higher theological education. And if you want to learn how to do good apologetics, pick up one of those resources I mentioned at the beginning of the program and are linked in the show notes. And consider going and taking some courses with Trinity Seminary on how to do good apologetics. God bless. Go now, share Christ, and show love. God bless.